what am I supposed to do? <laughs> Good evening. Um, it is a pleasure to welcome Glenn Stevens to our department. Uh, he is uh, a faculty in uh, the mathematics department of Boston University. And uh, he's going to discuss today about the theme of periodic variation of automorphic forms. So Glenn Stevens is an um, American mathematician born in 1953 who um, was a PhD student of Barry Mazur at Harvard University. In fact, the title of his talk, I suppose, is a quotation because I remember there was a very famous article of Barry Mazur called The Theme of Periodic Variation more than 20 years ago when this theme started to develop. And in fact, uh, Glenn is one of the most important contributors to the development of this theme. So he was probably one of the first to notice that periodic families of modular forms can be used in order to prove sort of classical global statements to describe global objects such as elliptic curves, modular forms, L functions, periodic L functions, and so on. And uh, the first application of this principle appeared in the famous proof of the Mesa Tate Teitelbaum conjecture a long time ago in 91. So Glenn is notorious for being able to explain in simple terms difficult concepts. And if you read his abstract, he's promised to tell us what the coleman mazur eigen curve is. So, uh, okay, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, before I start, uh, let me just explain that my hearing is not real good. Uh, and that means it will be, I, we have to make a little extra effort for questions. And so I want to stress that questions are wonderful. Uh, I hope you'll stop me often, ask lots of questions. Uh, I have some help. Francesc will be typing. I will use my laptop to read your questions if you ask questions. It works extraordinarily well. Uh, he's an excellent typist. I've already seen his work. It's very, very good. Okay. Uh, also, I will use the chalkboard a lot. I hope people can, can read uh, from in the back of the room, and I will not be offended if people sort of get up every once in a while and move closer. In fact, I would be very happy. Okay? Um, <laughs> okay, so I wanted to talk about this theme of piatic variation uh, of, of automorphic forms. Um, and I want to describe it just a little bit to give you a sense of what it is, uh, what it feels like, uh, and why we might be interested in doing this kind of thing. And so I should say right up front that the examples I'll be talking about are what are called automorphic forms of, of cohomological type. And that will play almost no role in what I say because it'll be hidden in the background. Uh, but um, so let me just start. I think the easiest way to describe this is just to give some examples. So I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to give some examples of modular forms. So I'm going to be thinking about automorphic forms on GL2. Those are called modular forms. And I'm going to start with some examples of modular forms. So you see the kind of thing that we are deforming, that we're varying. OK? So some examples. So here's an example. There are, they are the Eisenstein series. So if I have, say, an integer, k, k will be everywhere. It's called the weight. Uh, the integers, the weight that I will use will always be even integers, at least two. OK, that's just enough to say there are the modular forms I'm writing down are of cohomological type. And so the first example, oh, I should say also that I'll be working, these are going to be functions on the upper half plane. So this is the upper half plane in the complex plane. Z will be a variable on that. 
and I'll write q for the function that sends z to e to the 2 pi i z. So q in particular is a periodic function with period 1. Okay? And so gk is the Eisenstein series of weight k. It's a function on the upper half plane. Uh, gk of z is minus bk over 2k plus the sum over n greater than or equal to 1, uh, sigma k minus 1 of n, q to the n. So I'll just write it down as a series. I'm writing down the, the Fourier expansion of a modular form. The bk is what's called a Bernoulli number. It doesn't matter too much. You probably know what it is, but if you don't, it doesn't matter. It's a rational number. Um, and uh, sigma k minus 1 of n is just the sum over the divisors of n of the divisor to the k minus first power. Okay, very simple uh, coefficients. That's the Eisenstein series. Okay, let me give you another example. Here's one. It's, uh, it's the famous, it's a famous function. It's called the Ramanujan delta function because Ramanujan studied it. Uh, I'll just write it down. Delta of z is given by q multiplied by a product over n greater than or equal to 1 of 1 minus q to the n to the 24th power. Okay? Uh, and uh, let me give you a third example. I'll call it cleverly F11. I don't have a better name for it. Uh, F11 of z is q times the product n greater than or equal to 1, 1 minus q to the n squared times 1 minus q to the 11n squared. Okay? So these are three examples of, of modular forms. So let's just talk a little bit about them. So I just want to, I'll be talking about these for the next 15 or 20 minutes, talking about these three examples. Okay? Um, so what about them? Well, uh, they are modular forms. Um, <coughs> what does that mean? So that means, so uh, what's a modular form? A uh, function f, on the, they're all functions on the upper half plane, taking complex values. They're holomorphic. Um, <coughs> um, they're holomorphic. I guess that's all I've had to say. So that's property one. <laughs> and then there's property two. There are functions on the upper half plane that are highly symmetric. There's a lot of symmetry that, that you don't see from what I've written down, namely, uh, for each of these guys, there exists a gamma contained in SL2z. SL2z is just two by two matrices of determinant one with integer coefficients. That's a group. Gamma will be some subgroup of finite index. In fact, it'll be a congruent subgroup. It'll be defined by congruence conditions. And let me just give you an example, uh, i.e. gamma might be what we call gamma zero of n where n is some integer, that is just a set of all matrices A, B, C, D in SL2z such that C is divisible by n. So the lower left-hand corner is congruent to 0 mod n, uh, and it's not too hard to see that that is a subgroup. It's the, it's the, it's the preimage of a group in SL2z mod n where the lower left-hand corner is actually divisible, is actually zero. It's a preimage under reduction mod n. So that's a subgroup. Uh, and then, so in all of these cases, there is such a group, and there's also a weight greater than or equal to two, such that for all gamma in the group gamma, uh, if I take CZ plus D to the minus K times F of AZ plus B over CZ plus D, 
uh, that's the same thing as f of z. So see, that's a, it's a kind of symmetry that, uh, that these things have. The, the, the group gamma, or the group SL2z, acts on the upper half plane by fractional linear transformations, and so that gives sort of symmetries of the, of the upper half plane, which then impose symmetries on the functions on the upper half plane. And so I'm claiming that these f's are, are, are invariant, in some sense, under a certain group of, uh, of operators. There's a lot, they have a lot of symmetry. Uh, let me put the third property here so I get some space. Uh, they have good growth at the cusps. Okay, so what are the cusps? I'm thinking of the upper half plane. Here's the upper half plane. Uh, zero is on the real line. Uh, on the real line, I have the rational numbers. And at infinity, up here someplace, I go this direction, I get some point that I'll call infinity, I infinity. Uh, that's a copy, think of that, the boundary. Those are points on the boundary. It's a copy of P1 of Q. So every one of those points, when I say the word cusp, I'm thinking of one of those points. Okay? Uh, and so these functions all have the property, they're defined on the upper half plane, and they have good growth conditions as you move towards any one of those cusps along geodesics in the Poincaré upper half plane. No, no need to write that down, what that means. But, but there's a notion of, of good growth. And good growth, by the way, is polynomial growth. In particular, if you go to infinity, it really just grows like a polynomial in the, uh, in the imaginary part. Um, okay. Um, so they have good growth. And let me, let me just say that uh, if they have good growth, I'll call those modular forms. So the space of all things having properties 1, 2, and 3, the, those are the space of modular forms of weight k for the group gamma. Okay, so it's just some space of, well, I should say it's a finite dimensional space. All of these have that property. I'll be more specific in a second. But there's a special kind of this, another condition that's a little stronger than good growth at the cusp, and that's vanishing at the cusps. Okay, so in other words, if, not, if, the function, if these functions tend to infinity, say, and vanish at, in the limit, then I'll say it vanishes at that point. And the functions that have the property of vanishing at all of the cusps are called the cusp forms. Those are the cusp forms. Okay, that comes from the S, by the way. It comes from the German Spitzen, which means cusp. Um, okay, so in this particular case, the GK of Z, GK of Z is a modular form of weight K for SL2Z. That's true for every K. Uh, delta. Delta is a cusp form of weight 12 for SL2Z. So delta is a famous form. It's invariant under the action of SL2Z with the weight 12 action. And the F11 is a cusp form of weight 2 for the group gamma 0 of 11. OK? I'm going to keep talking about these things to give some context for what they might mean. OK? But this is what they are. They're modular forms. I'm sorry, the de board is so dense uh, for reading. But, uh, but just see that there's an Eisenstein series, a Ramanujan thing, and the F11 thing. They're just three modular forms. OK. So now, um, I think I can erase all of this. I want to keep my modular forms on the board. Um, <coughs> but they're holomorphic functions satisfying lots of symmetry uh, and having good properties at the cusps. So, OK, so that's the first thing. Let me call that. I'll, I'll call that A, I'll call this A is their modular forms. And then B, uh, this is an important thing to notice. It, I, it, I made it, the way I wrote it down, it sort of goes past without noticing. The coefficients are all Fourier expansions. And these Fourier expansions have coefficients. Right? You can take, uh, this is a, here's the Fourier coefficient. When I write it down, when I write Ramanujan delta down that way, I don't see it as a sum over the coefficients, but I can multiply it out. It'll be a sum over n greater than or equal to 1 
tau of n q to the n. So it has a q expansion. This is called the Fourier expansion. And this also can be multiplied out. And if you do, you'll get some sum. I'll call it a of n q to the n. a of n is just a made up thing for this particular function. OK, but tau of n is standard notation. Standard notation from Ramanujan's delta. OK, now notice the key thing I want you to see is that these coefficients are integers. OK, the only coefficient on the board that's not an integer is this one, the zeroth coefficient for the Eisenstein series. But the others are all integers. And that's the stuff that number theorists love. Right? Number theorists, that's what we do. We study arithmetic. That's a study of the integers. OK. And so we're going to use those facts. Uh, they are coefficients in z. OK, these functions, they are what are called Hecke eigenforms. OK, that's what a, what a person who works with modular forms says. They're Hecke eigenforms. I just want to say what that means. Uh, well, originally, what it is, what is going, uh, by the way, I should have said, uh, let me just say it now, that all of these spaces, the, the modular forms of weight k, that's a finite dimensional space. Cusp forms are finite dimensional. Uh, and so uh, Hecke describes some operators. They're Hecke operators. Pn acting on these finite dimensional spaces, preserving cusp forms, are one for each n, any natural number n greater than or equal to 1. You get a, a, what's called that. There's a way of defining uh, an operator due to Hecke. Uh, and well, these forms are eigenforms for all of those Hecke operators. If infinitely many operators, these guys are eigenforms. In fact, uh, the, eigen, the eigenvalue of, say, Tn acting on Gk is the nth Fourier coefficient, and the same for delta and the same for f11. So the Fourier coefficients themselves turn out to be the eigenvalues. Now, the meaning of this, though, the way that we think about this, I should say they not only that, they are what I'll call normalized eigenforms. If I say an eigenform, that only de de determines a, a, a vector up to a multiple. And so normalized means choosing which multiple. OK. Um, OK. And so what this means is that what's true is that if we write down, we can write down, if we write down, The L function, we call it the L function of one of these functions. The L function is a Dirichlet series. I'll write it down explicitly. Uh, it's defined to be the sum over n greater than or equal to 1 uh, if <coughs> a n n to the minus s, uh, where f of z is Fourier coefficients are a n. So the ANs are the Fourier coefficients. Just turn the Q to the N, the N to the minus S, and write that down. That's a Dirichlet series. Uh, then F is a normalized eigenform. If and only if, you can say it by just saying something very particular about this Dirichlet series. If and only if L of FS has what's called an Euler product an Euler product. So that means that L of Fs can be written as some product over primes L, 1 minus Al. Al is the lth Fourier coefficient. L to the minus S plus something epsilon of L, L to the k minus 1 minus 2S inverse. So I just invite you to look at this for a second. It's not, if you've never seen this before, it looks complicated, but it's not. Uh, if you look at what's inside the parentheses, it's a quadratic polynomial. 
in the variable L to the minus s. L to the minus s. It's a quadratic polynomial uh, with uh, integer coefficients in this case. Uh, I'm inverting that. And notice the constant term is 1, so when I take the reciprocal of a quadratic polynomial whose constant term is 1, that's going to be a power series uh, whose, whose constant term is 1. And so each one of these factors turns into a power series in L to the minus s. So that's what I would call a Dirichlet series concentrated on powers of the prime L. Okay, and I'm mul taking multiples of those things, and so when you multiply all those things together and think about the unique prime factorization theorem, you get a thing, it's this, oh, I already wrote it down, it's this L of fs, here it is. Okay, so this, this product is a beautiful thing. Now one of the things that in this case, in the, in the case that f is a modular form, this is equivalent to saying that the function uh, that sends n to a sub n is a multiplicative function. And that means that uh, for all n and m, uh, if n and m have no common factors, if they're relatively prime, then a s the, the nmth term is the product of the nth one and the mth one. So a of n times a of m is a of nm. Okay, so if I, all of these functions, I just invite you to look at these three functions. Okay, I'm claiming something that's actually quite remarkable. The sigma k minus 1 of n, that's actually a function, if you've had an elementary number theory course, you might have seen this before. It's a well-known example of a multiplicative function. Um, <coughs> summing the divisors like that, or some powers of the divisors. But if you look at the Ramanujan delta, for example, Look at the way these coefficients tau of n are, are defined. There's no reason in the world that one sees from the way I've described it why the tau of n should be multiplicative. Why should tau of n m be equal to tau of n times tau of m if n and m are relatively prime? Uh, it, it's not at all obvious. Uh, and the same is true for this guy. There's, there's no obvious reason why that should be true. Um, in, the, in the language of HECA operators, what's known, I said that delta is a weight 12 cusp form, but this space turns out to be one dimensional. One dimensional. And so delta is automatically an eigenform. And the same is true of F11, and F11 lives in this space, which just happens to be one dimensional. And so it's automatically an eigenform. And so the multiplicative property follows from multiplicative properties of the HECA operators themselves. Okay, so that's, but, but what I'm trying to get across here is that, is that the, the coefficients are interesting functions from an arithmetic point of view. Okay, they're functions from the integers, from the natural numbers to the integers, uh, and they're multiplicative. Uh, they have interesting properties just like that. Okay, um, so what else? Let me put a, a little extra remark here. D, uh, the coefficients they're not just integers, they're not just uh, multiplicative functions, but they encode interesting arithmetic data. And so uh, let me just try to illustrate that. At this point, I think I, think I can safely erase some of this. Um, I'll start by erasing this. <coughs> so let me give you an example of the kind of data. Uh, they're not just, they're not just uh, multiplicative functions, they're interesting arithmetic functions. And I don't know whether you think that sigma k minus 1 of n is, a, is an interesting one or not, but it's certainly one that we write about a lot in our elementary number theory courses. Okay, but the other ones are a lot more interesting. Tau of n and and A11, or A of N, let me start with the A of N. So here's an example. Um, associated to F11 it's associated to what's called an elliptic curve, which I'll call E11, uh, defined over 
And I'm just going to write it down. It's, it's easy to write it down. Here it is. So E11 is the following uh, cubic or cubic equation. Y squared plus Y equals X cubed minus X squared, I think. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm thinking of the X and the Y as variables, and I'm just thinking about plotting. Take, take this and draw it in R2, if you like. Uh, actually, we draw it in, in P2 of R. Uh, we throw in some points at infinity, or P2 of C, in fact. And um, we're actually looking at solutions where the X and the Y might be complex numbers. Uh, and if you do that, you get what's called an elliptic curve. You get a surface of genus 1. Um, okay, and so, but notice that this elliptic curve, the coefficients in it are rational numbers. In fact, they're even better. Okay, so F11 is associated to this elliptic curve in the following sense. For each L, each prime L, uh, the coefficient AL is L plus 1, mi this is L not equal to 11, I guess, AL is L plus 1 minus the number of points on this E11 defined in other words, I can take this equation and I'll reduce the coefficients modulo L. If you fix a prime L, I can think of that equation as if it had coefficients in Z modulo L, finite field, and FL, FL. Uh, and then uh, I can count the number of solutions, and I should say that there's a point at infinity that you don't see in this model. So when you count, count them and then add one. Remember, there's a point at infinity. Count, add one. Uh, subtract that number, and count them. When I count this, I'm counting the points and adding one. Subtract that from L plus one, that number will always be the AL in this case, for this guy. And if, uh, I mean, this is really a mar remarkable fact. If you've never seen this before, it's kind of amazing that these kinds of things are true. It really is. Uh, <coughs> but it's a true fact. Uh, it's known uh, and is a special case of a much more general Phenomenon, but the point here is that the coefficients of, when I said AL, I meant A of L, of course. I mean these coefficients. Uh, is that the coefficients of F11 are remembering somehow the local data for this elliptic curve. Knowing this modular form is the same thing in some form. It's an analytic way of keeping track of how many points there are on this curve modulo L for every prime L simultaneously. You put this like a generating function that encodes all of that information. Okay, so this modular form, as easy as it was to write down, contains stuff that you wouldn't expect to see. Okay, um, I can do, I can ask the same question for the Ramanujan delta. Uh, Ramana, the Ramanujan delta doesn't have an elliptic curve attached to it, its weight is 12. Uh, there's something else attached to it. There's some, something called a motive. You can write down the L function of, of delta in the same way that I wrote down the L function of F, but I've erased it, uh, by taking the Dirichlet series that you get and replacing Q to the N by, by, get, by replacing Q to the N with N to the minus S everywhere. And that is the L function of a, of a certain, some, what people call a motive, uh, associated to a, a tenfold fiber product of some universal elliptic curve over the J line. It sounds fancy, uh, and it kind of is, uh, but my point is, though, that that thing is an arithmetic geometric object, uh, and it's very interesting to number theorists. We're interested in these things. Uh, and so we're coding up that kind of arithmetic geometric data in this very simple modular form. And it's amazing how much of that arithmetic object is actually inside this can be recovered by looking at this modular form. Okay? Um, okay. Now, um, let me just uh, emphasize here that these, these L functions, so for each one of these guys I have an L function with an Euler product. Now, these L functions encode interesting data. And how do they do that? Well, you can take that L function, it has an analy it's defined and it's holomorphic for the real part of S sufficiently large. Uh, it has an analytic continuation for S in the, in the complex plane. Uh, and you can study the analytic properties of that L function. And that's an interesting thing to do. And you will find that uh, there are certain points uh, where you can say things like it might vanish here, or it might, it essentially takes 
a rational value. Sometimes the values are rational or almost rational after some well-known, well-defined period. Um, okay? Um, and so by looking at values at special points of those L functions, you might hope to recover data information about the object. And there's things like the birch swinnerton and Dyer conjecture, which is one of the uh, uh, centennial problems from the Clay Mathematics Institute, worth a million dollars, uh, which says that the order of vanishing of the L function of f11 at any given point, at, the, at, at s equals one, sorry, uh, it should be the rank of the elliptic curve. It's a very important number attached to the elliptic curve. Things like that. And so that's how you get the arithmetic data out. That's one way. It's a very straightforward way. Okay. Um, the other thing that I should say is that there, this process goes two ways. Uh, I've started with a modular form, and I'm saying there's, there's some arithmetic geometric object attached to it. You can ask the question the other way around. Suppose you go out into the real world and run into an arithmetic geometric object. Does it come from a modular form? And the answer is, well, I guess no, not necessarily. But, but when we can say in fair generality when it does. For example, there's something called, that was, used to be called the modularity conjecture. Actually, it was called the Taniyama Shimura Bay conjecture, but today it's called the modularity conjecture. Um, well, that was proved by Andrew Wiles along the way to proving Fermat's last theorem. The modularity conjecture says that if you write down any elliptic curve defined over Q, like this one, and you think about this thing here, the co these coefficients, in fact, determine a modular form of weight two uh, uh, with prescribed properties that you can read off of the elliptic curve. So it goes both ways in that case. And then there's a, there are other generalizations, something called the Fontaine-Maser conjecture uh, that extends that result to modular forms of higher weight and things like that. Okay, but in, in general, the feeling is that these certain geometric Galois representations, say of dimension two, should correspond to modular forms, and higher dimensional ones should correspond to other kinds of automorphic forms. And that's part of the Langland, what's called the Langlands philosophy. So this, this phenomenon is very general. I'm just writing down three examples, but it's a fairly general phenomenon. Okay, um, all right. Well, so we have modular forms. They contain interesting, uh, they correspond to interesting arithmetic geometric objects. Uh, and so we might use them to study that arithmetic. But there's another thing that you can do. The fact that the coefficients of these guys are, er er are integers means in particular that we can, might be able to hope to do arithmetic with the modular forms themselves. Okay, so let me just give you, this is the key thing that I want to say. Piatic variation has to do with this idea of doing arithmetic with the modular forms themselves. So let me just uh, give you three examples, two examples maybe. I'll call that E. We can do arithmetic. with the modular forms themselves. With, let me just say with them. <laughs> okay, with those guys. <laughs> okay, so, um, so let me just show you some examples. Here's one uh, example. I'm sure you know what it is, these things. Uh, F11, okay, you see F11 here, and there's Ramanujan Delta. F11 is congruent to delta modulo 11. Okay, if you look at this for a second, uh, maybe you didn't notice it when I wrote it down, but I hope you'll see it clearly now that I've said it. If you take one, min if you take, uh, one minus q to the n and raise it to the 11th power, and write down the, use the binomial theorem to compute the 11th power of one minus q to the n, you'll see that that is congruent to one minus q to the 11n. That's just the binomial theorem because the binomial coefficients 11 choose k for k between one and 10 or something uh, are, are all uh, uh, congruent to zero mod 11. And so this guy is one minus q to the n to the 22 mod 11. And so if you multiply that out, you'll get this guy. This is a very simple thing 
uh, that we can do very quickly with our students in elementary number theory classes right on day two or th three or something, once you know what congruence means, just by looking at things. So this congruence is completely clear. Uh, here's another one that's not so clear. Uh, delta is congruent to G12 modulo 691. Okay, this is one that Ramanujan noticed. Don't ask me how he noticed it, I don't know. Uh, but if you take this thing, multiply it out, and d d mod out by 691, tau of n is congruent modulo 691 to the, uh, 11th, to the sum of the 11th powers of the divisors of n. Uh, it's an amazing, it's an amazing fact uh, that that's true, but it's a rather common thing that there are congruences between modular forms that come from different places. And so what this is saying, somehow there's some sort of a, I don't know, a jigsaw puzzle or something, but things that feel like they come from different places are somehow congruent to one another. They're congruent. What does that tell us about the arithmetic geometric data that's being captured by the coefficients in the one as opposed to the other? That's the kind of question that we're interested in. Okay. Um, all right. So now let me talk a little bit about piadic variation. So here P is prime. Uh, it's prime. It can be two. I don't care. It won't be in these examples. Um, so then let me just give you an example of piadic variation. So for each k, we define g k star. It's going to be a variation uh, of, of g k. It's going to be a modular form of weight k on gamma zero of p. So I take the Eisenstein series I had wrote, written down before, gk star of z is gk of z minus gk of pz. Okay, let's just write it down uh, precisely, but uh, you'll see in a second why I would do that. If you write down the, the, the Fourier expansion of gk star, it is gk star of z is uh, p to the k minus 1 minus 1 divided by 2 times bk, times 2 divided by 2k, sorry, times bk, the Bernoulli number, plus a sum over n greater than or equal to 1, sigma n star, uh, sigma k minus 1 star of n q to the n. Now, I'm just modifying the coefficients of the, mod of the different, of the Eisenstein series gk, subtracting this thing off. You can, if you look at it, you can see something's <coughs> going to happen that you can compute. Uh, so I'll just tell you what the result of that computation is. Um, So, <coughs> so the, the where sigma k star of n is defined to be the sum over the divisors of n, z to the k minus one, but you only keep those divisors that are not divisible by p. Okay. Um, <coughs> In other words, I throw out the divisors that are divisible or that are divisible by p, and doing that is what allows me then to move gk. I can now move gk star in a piadic family, and I'm just going to show you how to do it. In fact, these are already ar arranged in a in a piadic family. Okay, and so uh, let me just state the basic theorem. It's an easy theorem. Again, it's something, except for all the fancy language. Uh, it's an elementary theorem. We could do it in, in, in our number theory classes. Uh, and that is 
uh, if k1, we have two weights, k1 and k2. If they're congruent, modulo p minus 1 times p to the r, then the g k1 star is congruent to g k2 star modulo p to the r plus 1. Now, piatic, when I use the word piatic, I should have said this at the beginning, when I talk about piatic things, the right way to think about that is it's congruence is modulo powers of p. That's all it is. So I'm, instead of just con congruence is modulo p, it's congruence is modulo powers of p in fancy ways. And so that's what we're doing here. We're paying attention to the power of p. Um, this is an easy com uh, consequence of the fact that d to the k1 minus 1, if I look at each one of these divisors, if p doesn't divide d, then d to the k1 minus 1 is going to be congruent to d to the k2 minus 1, uh, sort of term by term in that, in that sum. And that's a consequence of something called Euler's theorem that we also do uh, in all of our elementary number theory. It's an elementary fact. Um, but it's interesting because it implies some kind of what we would call continuity, uh, piatic continuity, of the, of the function that sends a weight k to g k star. In other words, if it says that if two weights are close, they're close in the sense that they're congruent modulo some high power of p with a p minus 1, uh, then, then the Eisenstein series are even closer to each other, modulo some higher power of p. And so that's some notion of continuity, uh, piatic continuity. And so um, let me just say, um, I'm thinking about the function. See, let me just write down. I'm going to let, I want to try to make this a little bit more precise. So let x be z modulo p minus 1z cross uh, z, what I'll call it, zp. And I have to say something about what zp is. Uh, and so uh, see, once I have this idea of piatic stuff, I can define a topology on the integers. I'm doing that I'm in my head. So if you take the integers, uh, here's an interesting topology to think about. Uh, an open set uh, or a basis for a topology of open sets is given by congruence classes modulo powers of p. So the congruence class a plus p to the fifth is an example of an open set. Uh, and I can change the 5 to 17 or whatever you want to do and change the center of that thing. Those are like, they feel like disks when I see them in my head now. And they give me a, the basis of a topology on Z. It's called the piatic topology. And it's very easy to see that it's a metrizable topology. And so you can define a metric, in fact, on Z uh, in the same way that we think about the, abs the standard absolute value. There's a piatic absolute value that gives me the metric that, uh, that can defines that topology. Uh, and so we can start to do analysis with respect to that absolute value in that topology. It's a very simple topology, much simpler than the one that we work, do calculus with, in fact. Um, so uh, that topology is a metrizable topology. I can take the integers and I can complete the integers with respect to that topology. And what I get is called zp. It's just sort of there are gaps that you sort of fill in. There are piatic gaps. I'll leave it to you to think about what those look like. But, uh, but there's a completion. It gives me a beautiful topological ring. ZP is a complete topological ring. It's compact. It's a beautiful thing. It's very easy to work with. Um, <coughs> OK. Um, and so then we can think about a function from x to modular forms. Uh, to, let me write it this way, two Q expansions, let me say uh, QP. QP is the, is the, is the uh, ring of fractions, or the field of fractions of ZP. Power series in Q, all of these guys are power series in Q, that takes K and sends it to GK star. 
Okay, so I'm giving this guy a topology, the Piatic topology. The, this also has a topology on the coefficients. And so the statement is that corresponds to this one. This easy theorem says that this function that I'm writing down is, is continuous in the obvious sense. It's continuous. And in fact, it's better than that. It's actually Piatic analytic. It's analytic. It can be defined by power series in the same way that you define analytic functions otherwise. Uh, and so uh, this is continuous. It is, in fact, I'll call it Piatic analytic. It's analytic in the Piatic topology. Coefficient by coefficient. Okay. Um, and so, again, we can, we can uh, what we've done, by the way, is we've defined a value of the gk. The k can be any element in this space. So the k's don't have to be integers. I should say that the integers are contained in x embedded diagonal, in diagonally. And so inside x, we have z, and the com completion of z is x. So we're extending the function that I've described over here to a function on that whole space and getting q expansions for every single point in, in x in a nice continuous way. That's called continuous piatic analytic or piatic analytic family of modular forms in the sense that it's a bunch of q expansions which at integer points are actually classical modular forms. And if you think about that, again, it's one of these things that that it feels a little weird that you should be able to take complex analytic functions and move them in piatic analytic families in this way. What's the meaning, for example, of gk star where k is not an integer? They're just coefficients that are, that are even piatic. Um, okay. So, um, okay, so this is, this example, this gk, gk star, this is the first known example of a piatic analytic family of modular forms. It's due to Serre, Jean-Pierre Serre, uh, a long time ago. Um, and uh, well the miracle is that, in fact, uh, the, it's the rule. It's sort of any time you have a, a, a normalized eigenform, just one small condition, uh, then you should expect that it actually belongs to a piatic analytic family, that it passes, there's a piatic analytic family of modular forms that passes through it. Uh, and so there are lots and lots, what that says is that there are lots and lots of congruences between modular forms. And so let me just at least write down uh, the theorem in words. The theorem is a theorem of several people. due to a guy, but first, uh, due to Hida, some guy named Hida, Haruza Hida at UCLA, uh, Robert Coleman, and other people. Uh, I'm just going to mention Mazur and Buzzer, though I won't state the theorem in the way that really includes what they, what they did. Um, <coughs> says that basically if that every normalized Hecke eigenform uh, let's say F in say cusp forms of way K they could be even I should say eigen they could do it for Eisenstein series too MK uh, but I'm going to say gamma zero of P to get rid of the, I don't have to state the extra condition uh, belongs to a piatic analytic family of modular forms. Also on gamma zero of P over the same group for different weights. Um, and they, uh, they, what they did is they showed how to, first of all, Hida and Coleman uh, showed how to deform it locally uh, and then Mazur uh, and Coleman uh, wrote a nice paper that described what they call the Eigen curve, which shows how to extend that so that it moves globally. And Buzzard did some other stuff with that. Uh, and so um, this phenomenon, in other words, of the existence of, of piatic analytics is very general again. And one should think about what that means if you remember that the, each point on that 
on that eigen variety, on that curve, on that m thing, corresponds to some modular form, at least at, at good points, at integral points, uh, which is corresponding to some global uh, arithmetic geometric object someplace, modular an elliptic curve or some tenfold fiber product, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and, uh, and you think about moving things along. Now, what does it mean to say that this data is moving? You want to see all of that data moving piatic analytically. Uh, now, I don't think I'd have to stop at five. Is that right? <laughs> I'm going to stop at five. Uh, and so I will stop at five. I would just summarize now. I can, whatever. I, we started late, but <laughs> I don't know if people have to leave. And so I, um, okay. So um, anyway, so the idea, by the way, I should say, uh, I wrote down two congruences over here. F11 is congruent to delta. That corresponds to the fact that there's a piatic analytic family, in fact, that flows from F11 to delta. Uh, that the delta is congruent modulo 691 to G12. Uh, that fact um, corresponds to the fact that there's actually an, uh, an analytic family that actually moves from the one to the other. Uh, there's a slight modification I have to make, but it's, just, it's morally true what I just said. Okay, so, um, <coughs> so let me just then at least uh, say I want to think about the kinds of global data that are attached to these modular forms. So I'll call this, I don't know what if I've labeled sections one and two, but this was section three in my notes. Um, so uh, global data uh, that, be, that is being varied in some sense. So what are we doing? What is the global data attached to these guys? Well, um, there are what we call Galois representations. I haven't talked about them. Uh, <coughs> let me say piatic Galois representations of dimension two in this case. That means there's some piatic vector space over QP and an action of the Galois group of Q bar over Q on it, uh, continuous action. Um, when you, the, all of these modular forms have a Galois representation attached to it. Uh, and as you move the modular forms, that Galois representation moves in a beautiful piatic analytic way with the modular form. Um, might think about, just when I think about these modular forms, I haven't talked about the cohomological properties of these mod modular forms, but periods of differential forms associated to the modular forms, in some sense, they should be moving along with the modular forms as well. But you have to make sense over what that means. As periods, we think of as complex analytic things. I want to be moving those piatic analytically. Can I do it? Does it make sense? Uh, I know there were others. Oh, right. Uh, the values of L functions talked about the values of L functions are the things that we use often to say, to, 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 to see properties of the geometric things that are connected to these modular forms. I'll look, take the L functions and evaluate them at certain points. Uh, the numbers that I get that way, does it make sense to move those numbers in piatic analytic families? Those are related to piatic L functions of various types. Uh, and then there's the cohomology. Uh, groups associated to these guys. Okay, um, now I wanted to say a little bit more, uh, but the point is that in some sense all of these can be thought of as moving piatic analytically with the modular form. Now, I just want I think I should actually stop. I can, if I start, it'll go for another 10 minutes, which I think is too long. Uh, <laughs> but I can talk to anybody who wants later on. What I would do uh, if I was continuing is I would make this last, the question is sort of, I I'm thinking about moving piatic, I'm uh, moving modular forms. Is that the right way to think about them? 
Uh, maybe the right way to think is I start with the Galois representation, and I should move the Galois representation and say that the modular form moves with it. Or maybe I should start with these cohomology groups, and those move. Now, the cohomology groups, of course, in the Galois representations, they're very closely related. And so it's sort of a, a in disguise, the same thing. So the question is, what am I starting with to moving? What depends on what? And there's not really an independent variable. They all move together. That's my point right now. Um, OK. Um, now, what I would have done is I would have talked about these cohomology groups very precisely by taking modular forms and writing down differential forms associated to them. And those then, those differential forms, by integrating them along paths in the upper half plane, give me numbers. Uh, let me just say numbers. Uh, they actually give me polynomials with coefficients that are uh, essentially algebraic numbers. Uh, and then I try to, as I move the modular form, I want to think of those cohomology classes as moving. And there's a way of making sense of that. Uh, and it's actually quite beautiful as well. Uh, depend is sort of defined in terms of sort of uh, what are called, what you might think of as Verma modules. If there's anybody here who works with uh, representations of Lie algebras, uh, then you might know that there's something called the Verma. If you just have a finite dimensional representation of a, of a reductive group the highest, with the highest weight vector, then there's something called the Verma module, which is an infinite dimensional thing, which is no longer irreducible, but it has a quotient that's equal to the irreducible representation you started. So the, the picture, what you do is you take cohomology with values in these finite dimensional representation spaces, uh, and then you lift them to cohomology classes taking values in the Verma modules that lie above the finite dimensional thing. Okay, so you make something infinite dimensional, which feels more complicated. But it's simpler for the following simple reason, and that is that if you look at the theory of Verma modules, you'll see that there's an obvious way to move Verma modules from one to another. They're defined in a way, if you look at the classical theory of Verma modules, you see it clearly, that things move in a nice algebraic or analytic way. You can move one Verma module to the other. So you start with a cohomology class of weight k. That's a, uh, it takes values in certain polynomials of degree k, certain finite dimensional space. Uh, you lift that finite dimensional thing to a Verma module. You deform the Verma module over to the weight k prime one, and then reduce again uh, to the finite dimensional space, and that gives you a family. So it sort of makes sense to, to make the analytic motion in the Verma modules, even though it doesn't feel like it makes any sense when you're thinking about the cohomologies with values in, in, in finite dimensional spaces. So, um, so that picture, then, uh, is, is an interesting one. And so the feeling somehow, in the end, is that all of these modular forms are should be coming out of something that feels like it's above it all. And everything is actually deforming. All of these modular forms that at the beginning were sort of separate and disjoint, they're getting closer and closer. As you see congruences and you see periodic variation, maybe there's something even fancier than that uh, that allows you to see these things in families uh, where they're all connected to each other in some interesting way. Uh, and I'll just say that I think that that is true, that you can do that, and that uh, it, it belongs to a theory of, of Cato in the end. Uh, about using K2 of modular curves and things like that. Uh, I can't talk about that now at all, but I just want to give a sense of it that one of the goals is to see how all of these things are connected, making some picture of something universal that captures all of this stuff that we see in this very elementary way. So let me stop. <laughs> Are there questions? If you have questions, we'll pass you this microphone. <laughs> well, I have a question. <laughs> so you, you promised to explain the Eigen curve, but you didn't really. So can you say what this Eigen curve is, or what it's good for, or whatever? Well. I'm trying to motivate the, the, the Eigen curve. Um, there's a picture that everybody draws in the end, which I, it doesn't really illustrate anything. It just makes me feel good to draw a picture. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so, uh, so there's, I, I don't know how to say it, except that there's a, some rigid analytic, periodic rigid analytic curve 
Uh, I, it would have to define the x more precisely to do that. Uh, and some, it's a picture, as a geometric, let me just draw the picture. Uh, it's not much of a picture, here it is. <laughs> and it sits over There's something called the weight space. It's a piatic uh, analytic, rigid analytic space. Uh, and there's some thing, some rigid analytic curve. The point here is that each point, and there's a map that takes, this is called the Eigen curve. This generalizes to other modular, other automorphic forms, by the way, not just uh, modular forms. And there's a map. And the fiber of any particular point, say some weight you're interested, there's, there might be some, some family of forms that lies over it. It's a, it's a beautiful thing, actually. But, uh, and so when I think about modular forms, I see this eigen variety, and I see the modular forms as being points on the eigen variety. I, this is the eigen curve. For modular forms, it's an eigen, it's a curve. Uh, and so this is what uh, Coleman Mazur uh, described rather nicely. Uh, and so it, it's a way of seeing all the modular forms together in some geometric object that, that connects them all. Uh, and so to describe that precisely would take a lot more time than I have uh, in an hour uh, in, a, in an expository talk. And so, uh, but it can be done. Okay, maybe, yeah, I can ask a question uh, it's a so if you think uh, of uh, mm, uh, Picard Fuchs equations Picard Fuchs equations so these are the equations uh, of uh, variation of cohomology okay but sometimes uh, these Picard Fuchs equations uh, like hypergeometric equations, they carry parameters of a different type. These parameters are uh, monodromy data. In, okay, and uh, right. you can vary both. You can vary algebraic parameters in families of algebraic varieties, but you can also vary uh, the ramification data over uh, a variety. That is, uh, in hypergeometric equations, you have f of a, b, c, lambda, and uh, the dependence on a, b, c is totally different from the dependence on lambda. So, for example, uh, arithmetically, you can think of the variation of the Frobenius matrix for a hypergeometric equation. So, my question is, which th does this dependence uh, resemble what happens for hypergeometric functions. That is, uh, these two types of variables, exponents of monodromy and uh, algebraic parameters. Do they look like, or is it enough? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I, okay, I can't really answer the question, unfortunately. Uh, but, but there is, of course, uh, there, there's a lot of interesting stuff that does happen. I don't think that you can think of it exactly as, as uh, Picard-Fuchs equations. Uh, but uh, but I'm, I'm sort of skipping over this. This is supposed to denote some sort of a ramification point. Another thing that happens, if I draw the entire Eigen curve, it might have other components that pass through these. And so sometimes you see things like this, too. And I'm only drawing the two-dimensional case, uh, the curve, case of curves. And if you work for other algebraic groups, you might get higher dimensional objects. And in that case, people have uh, studied things like monodromy around points of ramification uh, and, and things like that. I'm not an expert on that, but the answer is yes, those are the kinds of things that are in the background and that people are interested in. But I don't think it's quite a Picard Fuchs thing. 
We can talk later. Yeah, we'll talk later. thank the speaker again. Uh, let me remind you that uh, there are refreshments, I think, at the seventh floor in the common room, so everybody's invited, right? And uh, so uh, let's thank the speaker again. I know, I could see that. I could see that. But I kind of knew what he was talking, what he was thinking. I kept 